Myself working here, I get to meet lots of interesting people like yourself who do lots of interesting stuff. But of the people you met during this project, was there somebody who you thought, I wish I had that person's job? Well, I mean, the, the idea of spending five years standing by a lake, not having to worry about a mortgage, just throwing stones <laughs> into it, is, is, a, is a lovely idea. Um, you know, I, I don't wish that I was the head of snails at the Natural History Museum. I don't have enough interest in snails, but I love that... He did, and I, I, that's what I loved about a lot of these people, is that they'd found something they were so, so passionate about and so interested in and spent their life thinking about. So I think that's probably what I took away from it. It's, it's lovely to have something, whether it's you know, winning the World Hot Dog Eating Championship or do, doing all these wonderful things that, that gives you a passion. So, yeah. Fantastic. Um, so Evie is somewhere with the microphone. Hi. Oh, there we go. Um, so does anyone um, around in the middle section have a question, perhaps? Um, right up at the back. And um, we also have a microphone at the top. Um, so if anyone has a question there, Katie will be coming around. Um, anyone on here that I could come to quickly have a question over here? What was the furthest paper aeroplane throw? Ah, now let me look this up. It was the length of a hangar. Um, I, I've, I've got it in here, because I can't remember. Where's paper airplanes? 95. Um, so the, the really cool thing about um, the paper airplanes is there are two sorts of... There are two things that you want with a paper airplane to go the distance. Um, initially, you want something a bit like this, or even better, this one, that's really dart-shaped, and it go through the air really fast with no, with no drag and you're not losing much energy. But when it drops below a certain speed, you want something with the really big wings that keep it in the air and keep it aloft for longer. Um, and this guy, so I'll just, I'll just get you the distance first of all and then I'll explain what he did. Um, he was doing it in the, in the aircraft hangar of scaled composites, so the US company that also make um, suborbital space planes. Um, and it went 226 feet, so about 70 meters. Um, but what he, the, the trick to his plane was that it had two modes of flight. Um, there's something quite complicated happens to the top of it when it drops below a certain speed, and that changes its inclination. So you've got something at the back, so it flew a bit like a dart for the initial bit, then when it dropped below the speed, it changed into a bit like the lift one. So he got the best of both worlds. And he spotted it completely by chance. He made a plane which it completely confused him because whenever it dropped to a certain speed, it started turning round. And then he realised that whatever was triggering that, he could use in a different way to give it more lift to go further. Cool. Um, we have one up at the top here. So um, earlier you were talking about how uh, a doctor established that the furthest a frog could jump was uh, 1.73 meters, I think you said. Did he do that? This is the first part of the question. Did he do that just physically by scaring a frog from behind and seeing how far it could jump? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's, he's, not, he's not a very scary man, though, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but couldn't... I've seen simulations of where you put in uh, stats of humans, of, like, how much they can lift and stuff like that, and then you can simulate... Um, the fastest they could run. Could he not just do that with the frogs? Well, I mean, it's, what, what he jump. was doing was the sort of work that feeds into simulations like that. So that's why the raw data is, you know, at some point you've got to take it back to the real thing. Um, and that's what he was trying to do to work out how muscles work. So uh, I don't know if people have made frog simulator packages. I really hope they have. <laughs> What is the least landed on square in Monopoly? The least landed on square? You know I didn't find that out. Um, ah, hang on, no, but uh, square maybe not, but I do have the stats for landed on properties. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's the purples or blues, um, the, 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 the Mayfairs and Park Lanes, not because there are two of them. Um, but normalising and accepting the fact that they're two, they're still 
not as good in terms of it. So about, it's 122 hits on the oranges or the reds for every 100 hits on those. So those are the, in terms of getting people to land on you, those are the least, the least good ones. Okay, um, we have another question up on the gallery and then, um, Evie, do you want to come down here? Hello, is there a reason uh, why some people tend to win the lottery and is it, does it matter where you are geographically? Um, so I did speak, I, I didn't, I have spoken to people about the Monopoly. In fact, the same guy who did the, oh, sorry, the lottery, the same guy who did the Monopolies um, thought about it long and hard. Um, it's not completely correct to say that, you know, there's no way to improve your chances on the, on the lottery. Um, there's any six numbers are as likely as any others to come up, but you really want to avoid dates. Um, because what you want to do is you want to ensure that if you've won the lottery, you're not sharing it with anyone. Um, so, you know, all of those clever people who put one, two, three, four, five, six, thinking they're clever, they're going to share it with 10,000 people. Um, there's equally, if you look at the, you know, when you fill in the, um, when, when you fill in the thing in the shop, people tend to go down the middle of it. It's again, it's just like um, rock, paper, scissor, where you don't, Want, you can't be random if you're a human. So uh, my tip would be to use the, the uh, lucky dip because otherwise you're going to do what other people are doing even subconsciously. Even if you try not to, if you think, oh, a lot of people go down the middle ticking all the ones along the middle, so I'm going to tick them all up in the top right-hand corner, you'll find someone else who's had exactly that train of thought and is ticking them all in the top right-hand corner. So uh, there's no way to improve your chances in the lottery of getting the jackpot, but if you want to ensure that you're more likely to keep the jackpot, then I'd use lucky dip. <laughs> okay, do we, um... What is your favourite board game? My favourite... I am going to be boring. I really love chess. Um, I think it's an astonishing game. It's, it's not in my book, because, you know, what can I usefully... What can I conceivably usefully say about chess? It hasn't been said in, in thousands and thousands of words. But, I mean, I, I mentioned it earlier, but I find it amazing that a few thousand years ago, some people sat somewhere and crafted this game that has, you know, enough permutations that we don't begin to have a computer that can do the perfect game of chess. This is... It's, I mean, they, they can't pop possibly known it, but it's, you know, I, I play chess all the time with, with friends online, and I can play the same guy, you know, I can play 20 times, and each time, without realising it, we end up with a different game, it's, it's amazing, so chess. Um, Ooh, and then, Evie, do you want to get the girl over here, and um, we probably have time for maybe two more questions, if I can see, um, we'll go at the front here, and then um, up at the back there, so if we start here. Do you have any advice on how to win battleships? Yes, yeah. Um, so, uh, there are a few things. Um, first of all, when you're putting your ships down, if you have a ship on the edge of the board, you've given your opponent an advantage. Because if you think what happens when, you, let's say, you go randomly and you hit a ship on the edge of the board, um, then you don't know whether it's angled this way or that way, so you do both. Now, if it's in the middle of the board, you have to go to th potentially four other squares to find out which way the ship's angled. If it's on the edge of the board, you know that it's not one of those squares, so you've given your opponent an advantage because they don't have to try as many to know which way the ship's oriented. The problem is, of course, if you never put them on the edge of the board, you've also given your opponent an advantage because they know that you never put them on the edge of the board. Um, a really useful tip that it's so obvious when you hear it, but I'd never thought about it till I, I spoke to some people who had thought about it, is when you're um, trying to when you're trying to guess your opponent's ones, imagine the board's like a chess chess board. Only go on the blacks or only go on the whites when you're trying to to, to get them. Because the smallest ship is two. Um, and that means that if you only go on every other and then down the diagonals, there will be nowhere for that ship to hide. Even better, if you get the two, which is, this is why battleships isn't a really useless analogue for naval warf warfare. The, the, the one that's two is 
your best ship, the, the aircraft carries your worst ship. If you get the one that's two and you sink it, the next one's up three. So then you only have to go on every third, every, every third square to ensure that you get all of the, uh, all of the ships. So, uh, yeah, those are, my, those are my tips for battleships. Okay, I think we were going to... Was there a question at the front here? And then um, I think um, we were going to have... Were there, was, were there someone at the back that had a question? Um, we'll, we'll take that girl and then... Um, and then I think that'll be it, yeah. Do we have the question there? What are the chances of someone landing on Go in Monopoly? Landing on Go? Um, well, uh, assuming that there's... So, so the, the, the simplest answer is it's going to be about 1 in 40, um, because there are 40, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there are 40... No, there must be 38, because it's 10, and then... So about 1 in 38. Um, if I recall from Monopoly... You, d you aren't normally sent to go. You're normally sent and then don't pass. Or maybe you are. Is there, is there a community chest or chance that sends you to go? Can you, there's, there's, there's one. So it's going to be slightly, slightly higher than that. So my guess would be about one in every 35 <laughs> goes you're going to be on go. Um, is that... I forgot what it was. <laughs> That's all right. Oh, yeah. Is it better to pick, like, completely random numbers each time in the lottery or to pick, like, a certain number, like, certain sequence of numbers every single time for, like, every single time you play the lottery? Oh, I see. Um, I would advise against... So, as I said, sort of in, in general, make sure it's random, but then do you stick, I think, then, then do you stick with those ones once you got them. I'd advise not doing that for the simple reason it'd be so annoying if they came up and you hadn't bought a lottery ticket that week. Um, but in general, there's no, there's no advantage to be gained by changing them every time at all. Um, it, it's still just as likely to come up, except that psychologically you're locked into the lottery for the rest of your life and it's a really bad way to make money. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you um, very much, everybody, for all these questions. Um, and once again, a really big thank you to Tom for a really fantastic talk this evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm.